My mother had something in the neighborhood of 10 siblings. I was realizing I, I don't know exactly how many, but in that vicinity. Um, but Aunt Mary was by far the most important to me, to Debbie, and to our kids. I still remember Jacob and Ellie so excited because they got to have a sleepover with Aunt Mary and Uncle Ray in the Walmart parking lot in Marshall, Minnesota. Uh, and they had a great time with them there. It's strange thinking that someone you love is no longer in this world. I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that my aunt is truly in a better place. She really is in the presence of her Lord. Yet there's still sadness in the face of loss. Even so, sorrow is not our baseline as believers. Divine joy is our baseline, or as prolific author and well-loved preacher Timothy Keller puts it, coming joy. Keller pastored Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, and uh, it's interesting that I mention him today because our next pastor's book discussion book is one that was written by Timothy Keller, um, and its title is Forgiveness, and I'm looking forward to reading that book. Some of you may know that Keller died from pancreatic cancer at the young age of 72 just this May. It only makes the following quote on coming joy that much more poignant. Keller wrote, while other worldviews lead us to sit in the midst of life's joys, foreseeing the coming sorrows, Christianity empowers its people to sit in the midst of this world's sorrows, tasting the coming joy. Like anyone in this world, believers experience times of sadness and times of joy. The difference is, for those who know Jesus, that even in sadness, we retain the taste of coming joy through our hope in Jesus Christ. It was this very joy grounded in hope that I focused on at Ellen Ginn's celebration of life on Monday. Although Ellen and I, uh, excuse me, although uh, I didn't discuss this um, at the service, the, the clues point to her really embracing her faith in Christ and finding herself within the story of God much later in life. And if you hear her testimony, she shared about, uh, she got baptized when she was uh, already in retirement age. Um, and it was really later on that it seems that she embraced uh, following Jesus. Uh, the pictures that were shown at this memorial service and the stories that were shared were focused on that portion of her life in which she probably didn't have a strong sense of the joy of Christ, the joy of the Lord. It focused on things in which all who live in this world find happiness, hitting the beach, eating at nice restaurants, and family, and a lot of other things besides. So it was my privilege in what I shared to discuss the sense of coming joy that she embraced later in life. In fact, when I visited her just before her passing, even though she was barely cognizant she opened her eyes and look at, looked at me just for a brief moment, and I asked her one question. I asked her if she was ready to go home, and she very clearly nodded her head up and down. One of the last things Ellen did in this world was an expression of hope, an expression of her sense of coming joy. This is Timothy Keller's point. Not that we don't experience happy times in this world, we do. But that for followers of Jesus, happiness in this world is not all there is. In fact, the happiness in this world is not even close to the greatest happiness that we will ever experience. It's only a taste of the happiness that we experience as followers of Jesus and the hope that we had. As old blue eyes put it, the best is yet to come. And babe, 
won't it be fine? Now, he meant that differently than I do, but I'll tell you what. As a result, our happiness, divine happiness, is of God. It's the happiness that we find in knowing him, the joy that he gives us. And it means that even in life's sorrows, we taste a coming joy. We have a hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, 11, promised to us who seek the Lord. On this final Sunday in this series, I felt compelled to address a topic that has been touched on at numerous points throughout this series, but one that deserves a focused consideration here at the end. Happiness grounded in our future hope. And I love that Josh started out with his song that he wrote in the last year or so and has shared with us, Oh, Praise the Lamb. Because as we read in those scriptures from Revelation that he was quoting from, we're reminded that life is bigger than just us, that there is a God in heaven, that there are spiritual realities that go beyond our daily needs and wants, and that we have a hope that is eternal and that cannot be taken from us. Or to put it in more common parlance, those who are recipients of the redemptive work of Christ who find themselves within the story of God are promised a happily ever after that is out of this world. Now, I know that title is a little cheesy. I apologize. But I think it's important in a world where everybody knows happily ever after is the stuff of fairy tales. And it isn't cracked up to be what it promises The Christ followers have a happily ever after that lives up to the billing. But don't take my word for it. It's what Jesus says in John 16, 33, in the King James Version, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I invite you to turn with me to John 16. There are extra Bibles in the back. If you don't have one, there's also extra sermon outlines there for you to follow along. And what I just quoted is taken from the last verse of the passage that we're going to be looking at today. That's John 16, 33. We're going to start from the beginning. This will actually be the fourth time out of 23 sermons in this series that we have found ourselves in the upper room with Jesus and his disciples on the eve of his arrest and crucifixion. Talk about sorrow. The disciples are still struggling to understand Christ's announcement. He's told them that he's leaving them. They don't like this. They're saddened by this news. More to the point, they see this announcement as the end of their happily ever after. Have you ever been there? Has there ever been a time in your life where you received some news Or something happens, and in your mind you're thinking, my happily ever after is done. It's gone. I've lost it. I'll never know joy or happiness again because of this loss that I'm facing. It's a story common to man. Tragedy strikes and shatters our dreams, our hopes, our aspirations. It could be something brought on by our own bad choices, or as, in the, as is in the case of the disciples, it could be something completely beyond our control. But the result is the same. Disillusionment. We are sure we can never know happiness again. The disciples felt blindsided. Felt that Jesus' departure marked the end of their hopes and dreams. You see, they had aspirations that Jesus was going to conquer the Romans, and, and he was going to reign right there in Jerusalem. And they, were, they had already talked about, they were making their plans where I'm going to sit on his right and you're going to sit on his left and together we're going we're to take on this place. But here is Jesus saying, no, that's, that's not going to happen right now. Instead, I'm going to go. In fact, I'm going to die. The disciples are not very happy about this news. Yet in order for the disciples to embrace his departure as good news, it's going to require them to embrace his purposes. 
the principle is just as true for all of us. Joy is found in embracing his purposes. Follow along, if you will, as I read John 16, verses 5 through 11. Jesus says, Now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask, Where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin because men do not believe in me in regard to righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer and in regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Is there ever a time that we like to hear those words, this is for your own good? I mean, are those words ever followed by anything positive? It's almost as bad as, this is going to hurt me more than it will hurt you. Really? Are you sure about that? I'm not sure if the disciples believed Jesus in verse 7 when he said, it is for your good that I'm going away. Loss hurts. There is pain in seeing a dream evaporate before your very eyes. Yet the disciples' grief in verse 6 is due to the fact that they still don't get it. They don't understand Christ's purposes. This is what's behind Jesus' statement in verse 5. When he says, now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me where are you going? The disciples aren't concerned with where he's going. Their only concern is that he's going. Their vision was too limited to see that Jesus was returning to the Father, to his kingly reign. All they cared about was if Jesus leaves, where does that leave me? In this passage, Jesus answers that very question. In fact, he answers it over and over again, I appreciate pastor and author Eugene Peterson's insight in this regard. He says, we easily pick up the drift of the conversation. Jesus says two things over and over. He tells his friends that he is leaving. I am leaving the world and I'm going to the Father. Chapter 16, verse 28. I count 15 times in this conversation in which in one way or another, Jesus tells his disciples he is leaving them. The second thing he says, and this is also over and over again, is that he is sending them the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father. Chapter 15, verse 26. The Holy Spirit, also named the Advocate and the Spirit of Truth, is designated by name and by pronouns 24 times. 15 times he tells them he is leaving, 26 times he refers to the Spirit that he and the Father are sending. Jesus is leaving, the Holy Spirit is coming. I remember one time my dad talking about the preacher of our church growing up, and he said, the only thing I don't like about him is he repeats the same thing over and over again. I got news for you. Jesus repeated the same thing over and over again. Why did he do that? Because I have a thick skull. (laughs) Sometimes hard for truth to get in. Why does Jesus say these two things over and over again? Because like you and me, when we face trials, the disciples struggle to see God's purposes. What are his purposes? Well, here in John 16, Jesus says he's leaving so that the Spirit may come. His departure doesn't mean that his mission has failed. It actually reveals that it's just getting started by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says that the Spirit will convict people regarding sin, righteousness, and judgment. Jesus reframes this story for his disciples He wants them to to look at his departure, not through a self-absorbed, poor me lens, but through a big picture gospel lens. We've all seen this, haven't we? A severe trial comes and we retreat within ourselves. 
We become obsessed with our loss. We wallow in our grief. There's nothing wrong with grief. It is healthy, natural, and good. But the Bible differentiates hopeless grieving with hope-filled grieving. To grieve with hope is to see the bigger picture of God's work in our world. It's this kingdom work that Jesus is all about. And this is the picture Jesus is seeking to reframe for the disciples in the face of their grief. At the heart of this picture is the fact that his bodily death will not mean less of him, but more of him through the presence of his Holy Spirit. So Jesus tells the disciples, it's for your good. Ultimately, he is inviting them to embrace his perspective. We see this as we continue in verses 12 through 15. It says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. And by the way, if I pause there for a second, Jesus said a lot of these similar things about his own ministry, right? I, I come, I represent the father, And so we see here the unity of the Trinity, the unity of the Godhead, the three persons, Father, Spirit, and Son. They're all about the same thing and of the same essence and have the same message. And so Jesus is saying, just like me, the Spirit's just going to be telling you what the Father told him to tell you because we're all a part of the same story with the same perspective. Verse 14, he will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. A few few years back, I had the privilege of sitting in on a Western seminary class taught at a satellite campus in Bellevue. And it just so happens that the prof who was teaching this course was one of my old profs. And he was lecturing on the Tanakh, the Hebrew version of the Old Testament scriptures. He was preaching some of the same material that I've shared with many of you on the story of God in that sermon series we had a few years back. At one point in the lecture, the prof revealed that he worked hard to unpack this material thoughtfully, slowly for his students, knowing that if he unloaded it all at once, it would be too hard for them to process. In a, th- in a sense, I think this is what Jesus is talking about when he says in verse 12, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. I honestly believe that if we saw spiritual realities all at once, if they were just dumped on us, we would be overwhelmed. We wouldn't know how to process it. But thankfully, God is patient, and he takes his time with us, and he teaches us step by step, helping us to grow in him. And so Jesus is saying the same thing. You disciples, you couldn't handle all of this. It's mind-blowing stuff. And the disciples are struggling to take it in. But Jesus goes on to say, here's another beautiful thing about the coming of the Spirit. You see, he's going to help you grasp these truths. At this moment, the disciples are feeling confused. After Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, his Spirit is going to help them to see the big picture story of God perspective on what is happening to them at that moment. Question, do you ever struggle to understand what God is up to in your life, in the lives of those around you? You ever go, what is happening, God? Why is this happening to me? Do you ever look at the world around you and experience fear, confusion. I was just talking with our family last night about the fact that the Renton Reporter, which we didn't receive for many years, and then all of a sudden started appearing over the last few weeks. I'm not sure why. I have no idea what, what I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's now on my driveway once in a while. Um, but as I read the Renton Reporter, uh, I saw... Th- Three accounts, two of killings, one of that almost 50 pounds of fentanyl, enough to kill 10 million people that was found right here in Renton. And I was thinking, well, I remember reading the Renton Reporter when we first got here, and I don't remember (laughs) this much heavy stuff in this newspaper. 
I think for some of us, we look at the world around us and, you know, I think we used to find some comfort in knowing that, well, things are pretty orderly in our country. We've lost some of that comfort. It's been replaced with fear, with doubt, with confusion. You ever wonder what God's up to? Why is he allowing these things to happen? You ever wonder in the midst of life's storms? how your pain, your struggle, your loss fits into God's big plan. The problem is that when we face trials, our tendency is toward tunnel vision, to become myopic. And that's our word for today. You can write it down if you want to. It's myopia. I had to go to my good old Funk and Wagnall dictionary to get a great definition that is defect in vision, so that objects can be seen distinctly only when very near the eye, nearsightedness. And it's funny, because if you remember my analogy last week that I shared with you about nearsighted individuals standing before a huge tapestry, and we're only able to see just a small portion in focus, it's the same concept. All the disciples can see is what is right in front of them, the departure of their rabbi. Their teacher is leaving them. But they aren't the only ones who suffer from myopia in the scripture. One of the greatest portraits of myopia is found in Isaiah 40, where we see the people of Israel in captivity crying out to Yahweh as if he doesn't see. And then we have these great words, well-known words, that come at the end of Isaiah 40 after all of their complaining This is how God responds, Isaiah 40, verses 27 to 31. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from Yahweh, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Yahweh is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in Yahweh will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. God is seeking to expand Israel's perspective here in Isaiah 40 to see that even though they go into captivity, God is still God. He's still on the throne. And he's still accomplishing his kingdom purposes. It's the same thing we see in the angel telling Abraham that his elderly wife is going to have a son. Again, Abraham has tunnel vision. My wife in her old age is going to have a a child? (laughs) Funny. And then Sarah does the same thing. Overhearing this, she laughs. Both Abraham and Sarah laugh at the idea of an old woman having a baby. You see, God had promised Abraham that he would be the father of a nation as countless as the sand on the seashore. So when Sarah appears to be infertile, Abraham and Sarah are confused. As a result, rather than trusting in God and trusting that he knows what he is doing, they take matters into their own hands. Of course, God clears up their confusion and shows that he was in control all along, and he provides Sarah with a baby in her old age. What we see in this story is not only the need for us as followers to embrace the divine perspective, but it's also that we must learn to trust divine providence. It's our third prerequisite to joy. Joy is embracing his providence. Follow along as I read John 16, verses 16 through 22. In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. Some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you'll see me no more, and then after a while you'll see me, and because I'm going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what Jesus is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. 
A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. I love this picture of childbirth, of pain that is turned into joy. Jesus tells the disciples that what appears to be a severe loss to them will be turned upside down by providence. This providence with a capital P will first of all take the form of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, the Father's provision of life for the Son. With what result? Their grief at his death is going to be turned into joy. They will see him resurrected Not only is there joy over knowing they'll see Jesus again, but there is joy knowing that he is going to continue to guide and lead and provide. Verses 23 and 24. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth. My father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your Joy will be complete. By the way, do you hear the repetition of the word joy in chapter 16? Saying, here is where your joy is. Here is where your happiness is. I know you're sad right now. What Jesus points to, however, is a direct line to God. Remember, in the Old Testament, only the high priest could enter the most holy place, and that only once a year. But Jesus foreshadows His sin-conquering death by which the curtain keeping us out of the most holy place will be torn in two. He will pay the penalty for our sin so that we might stand before God forgiven. Reconciled to our maker. Not because of what we have done. Because all our righteous works are are like filthy rags. But because the holy God of all creation came to into this world to die on the cross to pay for our sins to reconcile us to himself to our God as a result through Jesus we may approach God as the provider for all of our needs this is what Jesus means in verse 23 when he says the father will give us whatever we ask in Jesus' name again this is not genie in a bottle stuff So if you think we just rub that lamp and he'll give me three wishes, that's not what he's talking about here. This is not God as a cosmic bellhop that is at our beck and call. This is all in the context of disciples who are intent on continuing the mission Jesus started and the recognition of God's provision in that great work. God is furthering his kingdom. Are you part of that work? Because all the great things we see around us, all the great innovations that we see and the awesome things that man is doing in this world, it'll all eventually pass away. But the things of God will remain. God is building his kingdom. And he's telling the disciples, listen, God is going to continue to work in you. Even though I won't be present with you, you're going to continue this work and God will provide for you as you continue to do the work of the kingdom that I began. It's all in the context of the disciples continuing the work of the gospel. And what is the result? The result is joy. Completed joy. Joy to Filled to the brim. Look at that last sentence in verse 24 again. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Now, if you'd been reading the Gospel of John, when you hear these words, you automatically think, wait a second, I've heard that before. That's come before in the Gospel of John, John chapter 3, verses 28 And 29, by the way, if you have one tool for Bible study in your Bible, one tool only, it should be cross-references to help you see what is being referred to and how it refers to things that have already been spoken. So we see John 3, verses 28 and 29, we read, you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ. This is John the Baptist speaking, but I'm sent ahead of him 
The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him. So in this analogy, John the Baptist is a friend of the bridegroom. Jesus is coming, but his conclusion is what is important here. And is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. John the Baptist says, I have completed joy because the one that I was preparing the way for. By the way, you go back to Isaiah 40 for that. John the Baptist will prepare the way for the Lord. He says, my joy is complete because I get to see the arrival of Messiah. We also see the promise of completed joy earlier in the upper room discourse. Jesus says in John chapter 15, verses 9 through 11, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete, filled to the brim, absolute, nothing lacking, completed joy. And it's very similar to what Jesus says back in John 10, verse 10, in that wonderful passage about Jesus being the, the good shepherd. But John 10, verse 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. In all of these, joy and fullness of life is sourced in God's providence. Providence with a capital P. It's also important to say that this isn't a transactional thing. We do for God, so God will do for us. Like we got to put in our payment we got to earn it or deserve it. This is not transactional. This is about love. We love and trust God because God has loved us. We read this in verses 25 and 28, back there in chapter 16. 16, 25, though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I, when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day you will ask in my name, I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and I've believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. So Jesus has been taking care of the disciples, providing for them, leading them, but now he was departing and they were beginning to wonder who would care for them, lead them, provide for them. At this point, Jesus reveals to them that a significant change is coming about. Instead of being directed, I should say indirectly, blessed by the Father by following Jesus, these disciples will be able to go directly to the Father through Christ. Why? Because the Father loves them. This is how we relate to God on the basis of love. It is not transactional. It's based on the fact that our God loves us. And that is what Jesus is seeking to help the disciples see in the midst of their grief. What Jesus reveals here is that through his sacrifice, we are able to come into a love relationship with the God who made us. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing because we are dependent upon our own strength, but through Christ, we are able to live in relationship with the God of all creation. And because we are adopted as his children, he takes care of us as any good father would. When you think about the implications of who we are in Jesus Christ, it is mind-boggling. Are you adopted by the Father into his family? It's kind of funny. We had a couple families over last night, friends of ours. Uh, both, both families are involved in ministry, one on the Yakima Reservation, the other family at a church down in Puyallup. And it was good to have fellowship with them. We were talking a little bit about um, adoption, not spiritual adoption. We we're talking about adopting kids. It was a conversation, and I thought it was kind of interesting because while we were having this conversation, there was uh, a young lady there who had really been adopted by one of these parents at, from the Yakima Reservation. And uh, it was interesting when she was younger. I think there were tough times. I mean, if, if any of you have been involved in adoption, if you've heard stories, when you adopt, the older the kid is, the there can be more struggles because they've already got kind of things built in, right? But I was just thinking just how different she is. 
how, how much transformation has taken place in her life because this couple have loved her as their own. And it makes me just think about the great love our God has for us, has for you. And I don't know what you grew up with, what you experienced in terms of parents and love from a parent. I'll tell you my story is a complicated one, to say the least. And I know a lot of you have complicated stories out there, but I do remember a time when I realized that even though my earthly father may not even have the capacity to love me the way a dad should, that I have a heavenly father who loves me and has loved me more than any human father could. And I belong to him, am adopted by him in love. And so Jesus, as he's leaving the disciples, he wants to impress upon them their relationship with the Father. This is what they need to know that God loves them and cares for them and he will be with them and will be leading them through whatever they face. So the implications for the disciples is that they don't have to worry about Jesus' departure because God the Father loves and cares for them and the message is just as true for us today. God wants to be our provider. This is one of the names by which God reveals himself in Hebrew scripture, Yahweh Yara. Yahweh provides. The problem isn't with his provision. The problem is with our natural inclination to live independent of God. If we want to live independent of the Father, he will oblige. But when we do so, we miss out on the blessings of divine providence and the benefits of entrusting ourselves to the all-powerful, all-loving God of all creation who knows what is best for us. Let me just ask you that question. Do you believe that God knows better than you do what is best for you? It's one thing to say it. It's another thing in the face of loss to believe it. This brings us to the revelation that joy is embracing his peace. Follow along as I read verses 29 through 33. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. You believe at last, Jesus answered. But a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The disciples have been traveling with Jesus for more than three years, have seen him heal the blind, command the storm, and raise the dead. And only now, on the eve of his arrest and crucifixion, we believe. And why? Well, in the context is because Jesus was able to read their minds. They go, oh, he knows what we're thinking. He answers us without us even having to ask. What makes this epiphany on the parts of the disciples even more ironic is the fact that these men who are so confident in Christ on this night in the upper room are all going to scatter the next day. They're all going to flee. In fact, as we considered last Sunday, the leader of this motley crew will end up denying that he even knew Jesus. Yet yeah, what this passage magnifies is the unbelievable joy Jesus shows to his disciples. Jesus is not concerned that they are going to turn away from him in his darkest hour, but he is concerned about the guilt that they'll feel as a result. So he says, you will turn away from me, but don't worry about it because I'm not alone. The Father is with me all the way. What an example Jesus sets for the disciples, for us. He knows the turmoil they will go through, and he shows them that just as he can go through crucifixion because the Father is with him, they can go through the difficulties of life on planet Earth because the Father is with them. Here is our peace in the storm. Here is our ability to know joy even in the midst of grief. Is it because life will be easy if we follow Jesus? On the contrary, he promises it will be hard. 
So where does this peace come from? It's found in those concluding words, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Again, that's the King James Version. Who has overcome the world? Jesus. Not cleverness, stick to power of positive thinking, karma, money, pleasure, not even religiosity. What is it that overcomes the world? Or better, who is it that overcomes the world? Jesus. We find this reality, the first of three keys to experiencing divine happiness, to tasting the coming joy of this happiness forever. And that is, first of all, we need constant reminding of Christ's victory. If you pay close attention to this passage, you will notice that the blessings of which Christ speaks have nothing to do with the disciples' inherent moral rectitude or capacity to grasp spiritual concepts or even religious zeal. It's Jesus. It's what he will accomplish on the cross, which leads us to the most profound result of his crucifixion. And our second application point, we need constant reminding of God's presence. Jesus is sending the counselor, his spirit, It's the repeated truth Jesus shares in the upper room. They are not left orphans. They will have his presence, like the old hymn says, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Of course, the best way to remind ourselves of God's presence is to cultivate his presence in our lives through a daily walk. But such work does require constancy, repetition, discipline. The same could be said for this final reality which we need constant reminding of, and that is our heavenly hope. We find joy in the knowledge that we have a heavenly hope, the knowledge that we will be united with our God and will be his people for eternity. People like to talk about these days what sparks joy. What sparks joy for you? Here's a question. Does the reality of your heavenly hope spark joy for you? I love what Randy Alcorn says in this regard, as he quotes Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher of old, he writes, teaching seminary students about preaching, Spurgeon said, when you speak of heaven, let your face light up with a heavenly gleam, let your eyes shine with reflected glory, and when you speak of hell, well then your usual face will do. (laughs) Does the reality of our heavenly hope make your face light up. It should. For it is this heavenly hope that is our greatest source of happiness. Not only future happiness, but this future hope gives us happiness in the here and now. I return once again to Randy Alcorn, who writes, the truth is, we'll be far happier in this life if we understand it isn't our only chance for happiness. And neither is it our best chance I've read books on happiness stressing that we must be happy right here and now, living in the moment, because this is all we have. But the Christian worldview is that God's people will have an eternity of present tense happiness. This assurance of never-ending happiness is capable of front-loading joy into our lives. In the ages to come, we'll remember past happiness and its cause, God, and look forward to future happiness and its cause, God, So if you're not happy today, or if your happiness isn't as deep as you wish, relax. Take a deep breath. You're not missing your only opportunity to be happy. The time is coming when there will be nothing you can do except be happy. And that time will never end. Still, the Bible makes clear that God doesn't want you to wait until then to be happy in Christ. If we're honest, happiness is hard to find in a world where we're constantly bombarded with messages that evoke envy, fear, lust, and discontent. That's why we need constant reminding of who we are, whose we are, and where we are going. By the way, that's a big part of why we need weekly worship with the people of God. Regular time studying God's word together with God's people out of this, outside of this service, as well as daily set apart time to be alone in his presence. It's through these disciplines that we are reminded of Christ's victory God's presence and our heavenly hope. Now, maybe you think I'm preaching to the choir here. Obviously, on the whole, we're here because we already believe Jesus is the answer. However, just like the disciples, we all face daily the temptation to doubt, worry, fear. We need Jesus' instruction just as much as the first disciples needed it. We need Jesus to reframe life's story for us, to reframe life's storms 
so that we can see them through the lens of his sin-conquering crucifixion and resurrection, through the lens of his indwelling, all-powerful Holy Spirit, through the lens of his unending kingdom reign. Believer, herein lies our happily ever after. It lies within the joy of anticipation. May we cultivate this sense of anticipation as we contemplate our coming joy. Let's pray. And God, we thank you for the richness of your word and for just how firm our hope is in you and the joy it brings us to know that there's more to life than the things that we see around us every day. God, help us, help us to cultivate a life that resides within the hope and the joy that we have in you. Lead us as we leave this place today by your Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's precious name. And all the people said, amen. Amen. I invite you to stand for our benediction. Just a quick reminder, come back tonight at 6 p.m. Join us for a rich time together. But I want to conclude with these words I thought were appropriate as we conclude this sermon series. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen.